Thank you so much. I feel quite privileged to be talking to you today, Evan. Welcome to Australia. Thank you. And that video is part of a four-minute video called This Flag, April 2016. It became a rallying cry for, for Zimbabwe. Did you think ever that you'd have the guts to do that? <laughs> I've often said that um, you could never have paid me enough money to, uh, to do that. Uh, particularly when uh, you consider the history of our nation, Zimbabwe, and what has happened to many people that did uh, things like that. In fact, uh, a year earlier, in March uh, 2015, a young man who was the same age as I was um, went missing after he mounted a one-man protest in the town square uh, demanding for Robert Mugabe to step down because of his incompetence. And up to today, Itai Zamara is missing and no one knows where he is. So I'm thinking that was fairly unplanned then. You were angry or frustrated or, or what prompted it? Very much frustrated. That video clip, I was in my, in my church office. That's my, that's my, uh, my day job. My, my night job is, uh, you know, giving uh, authoritarian regimes sleepless nights, I guess. <laughs> and you but do that very well. <laughs> But I, I was sitting in my church office on that day and was really frustrated with where Zimbabwe was at, particularly because as a father to two um, uh, young girls, I was fa starting to fail to put food on the table for my children. And I thought to myself, there is just no reason why a young person like myself would fail to, to realize the dreams that they've always had. And the realization for me, I remember, and the flag I had in that video is this very one here. It, it sat behind me um, uh, as, as part of my office, and I remember thinking to myself, had I been in another country, and it's a horrible thought, had I been in another country, I would be better off than I am. And so the conclusion was that this nation and the people that run this country have stood in the way of my dreams and the way of the dreams of my children, possibly. And so that rant came out, and I've often described it as a rant that I had. And it wasn't really thought out? No, you no, no. You scripted, Th you there just... Was, <laughs> there was absolutely no script to that. The, the in, you know, the, the way this video came out was that I was, I was speaking to just a few... I thought I was speaking to a few people and, and expressing to them what they had always taught us. In Zimbabwe, they've taught us when you're a child what the flag means. Yeah. Every color, every emblem means something. And th th that's part of a four-minute video. At the beginning of the video, I talk about what they taught us these symbols mean. But then I also began to talk about what it seems they now mean and how the promise of this flag has been broken uh, for every Zimbabwean. And you did that as a small-time clergyman, pastor, a small church, maybe 50 parishioners? Oh, yeah. Our, our church is, you know, it, it, it was about 50, maybe 60 people. And, you know, it, it, it grew much smaller the moment the video started to go out. I bet it did. But, <laughs> to go out. But it changed your life almost immediately. Just tell us about that. It, it, was, it was probably the scariest thing I had ever encountered in my entire life. Um, First and foremost, the attention that this video began to generate from Zimbabweans across the world. And there are many Zimbabweans. It's estimated that there's probably about 4 million Zimbabweans that live outside Zimbabwe, and our population is about maybe 11, 12 million. So that's a big part of our population. Um, but Zimbabweans, both at home and outside, began to respond to this video and began to talk about how they felt about Zimbabwe, about how the injustices that have taken place over the years had robbed them of everything that they had ever dreamed of and how they wanted to come back home, but they couldn't. And so it, it, it was an accidental movement. The intention was not to start a movement. The intention was for me just to have a rant, shut it down and just go home. As a personal cry from the heart, that you were struggling, you were doing it as an individual act, not on behalf of your country. Absolutely, yeah. Uh -huh. How long did it take before it became an internet sensation? Um, it probably took about 24 hours. <laughs> and what was the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that was that the, the government um, was, not, was not happy about it. Robert Mugabe, who was the, the president at the time, um, began straight away uh, talking about um, uh, these 
uh, these pastors who were being used by the West as regime change agendas, uh, specialists, as he would, he would refer to me. And for maybe about um, a month after that, I was the center of some serious abuse by both state media and many of the politicians that were in Zimbabwe. In fact, one of the uh, ministers who, um, uh, strangely or weirdly, is now no longer in Zimbabwe because of the changes that happened, he actually fled Zimbabwe. Uh, one of the ministers described me as a fart in the corridors of power. <laughs> and, 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 and um, you know, it's, it, it, we always then laughed about it afterwards, and we said, well, it seems the stench grew quite strong, didn't it? <laughs> um, but, but, you know, during this time, this month, and the government's not happy, and you, you'll be arrested shortly. Well, what then happened was that I tried to... To, to find a way to stop this attention and what, what I was doing because I thought this is, not, this is not what I would like to carry on doing. So I thought I would make one more video to try and explain what I was doing. But in explaining this, what I was trying to do, it seemed to encourage more people <laughs> to get involved who began to make their own videos. So I thought, let me make another video to try and explain <laughs> What I was explaining. How many videos have you ended up making? Well, I think I've ended up making maybe about 98 videos <laughs> up until now. <laughs> so the government got crankier and crankier. Oh, yes, they did. And, you know, it, it was really strange because one thing led to another. Nothing was, was planned. Eventually, we obviously saw that we were onto something in terms of reawakening this sense of citizenry and this sense of being proud to be Zimbabwean. And so um, the government was introducing a new monetary policy at the time. And we challenged this policy uh, and uh, said to the government that you can't keep taking citizens' money. So we asked the Reserve Bank governor, and a friend of mine, his name is Henry, we thought, why don't we play a prank and write the governor a letter and challenge him to a public debate? He's never going to come. And we wrote him the letter, and lo and behold, he accepted to come to this debate. Which, which then sparked what we called from tweets to the streets because we, we started off on Facebook and Twitter, but now here we were crystallizing and materializing uh, in, in, in real time. And that debate was outstanding because we saw young people, we saw ordinary people speak truth to power and tell the governor, not in economist terms or in political terms, but in ordinary speak, that you are stealing our money and you are destroying our lives. Um, eventually what then happened was that when they refused to listen to us, I made a video and this time I really was genuinely upset. And this video I said to Zimbabweans, if you are serious about seeing a better future for your children, we're going to find one day where none of us will go to work because in Zimbabwe it is, and it was illegal to protest on the street without, you cannot get on the street and protest against the government without permission from the government, which doesn't make any sense. But um, so I said, look, why don't we do this in reverse? Instead of getting out on the street, let's stay at home. Nobody goes to work, nobody goes to school, nobody opens their businesses. And let's send a message to Robert Mugabe that he cannot continue to destroy our lives and to treat this country as if it's his personal property. And of course, that went viral and over 9 million people responded. And on July 6th of 2016, the entire country came to a standstill. I was shocked uh, at it. Thank you. Thank you. You were all so arrested, weren't you? <laughs> and that's the other side of... Uh, <laughs> the other side of all of this. It took about a week as the government tried to decide um, what to do with me and with um, what was going on. And of course, it was ridiculous for them to, to arrest me for telling people to stay at home, which was brilliant because it was a dilemma action for them. Uh, but eventually on July 12th, they decided that they would arrest me and charge me with attempting to overthrow a constitutionally elected government. And essentially that meant I was facing 20 years in prison if found uh, guilty. And it was a moment in which I think I suddenly began to realize that this was much more serious than I had uh, anticipated or thought. And throughout the experience of that first arrest, I think what angered me the most, apart from being afraid, was the fact that I found out whilst I was in prison 
that my wife, who was pregnant at the time, um, told me, together with the teachers of the school where my children were, that the state security had visited the school where my children were and had demanded to see my children. And it's a, a moment that made me understand what we were dealing with. The lady who owned the school where my kids go to, and I owe her, I owe her so much, she's a, she's a white lady, she refused for them to see my children. And and it was a sign to me that people, when given a chance to rally around speaking truth to power or confronting an oppressive regime, they will do it as long as they understand that if they don't do it, it'll affect them too. And it was people standing up for you that meant you were released. That night when we were at the court, over 5,000 people gathered at the courts and surrounded the courts and refused to leave until I was, I was released. It was, it was an outstanding moment. And one which I owe to the bravery of a people that a regime had oppressed so much, and yet they stood up and they said, never again, we refuse to be intimidated by you. I suspect those people owe you a fair bit too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> this must have played on your mind, though, the fact that your family could become targets. You made the decision to actually leave the country after they were threatened. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the, the day that I was, I was released that night, and I found out the kind of pressure my family had been under. I made the decision immediately that they needed to be in a safe, a safe place. P primarily, I had begun this journey because of my family. And um, it was important that they be in a safe place. If I had failed to provide for them, I was not about to fail to protect them. And so we, I made the decision immediately and we had uh, to move them out of the country. And it, it was the most dramatic um, uh, <laughs> Uh, escape or at least um, uh, um, uh, extraction, if I can use that word, out of the country. And I uh, took them away to a safe place. And whilst that felt very good for me to have been able to do, I think the most unexpected thing also took place during that time. I hadn't realized how much hope Zimbabweans had placed in what I was doing. I hadn't quantified at all how much people had expected that this was the thing that would probably set them free from what they felt had been an impossible situation to move out from. The depth of the disappointment in me by my fellow countrymen for leaving at that point is, is, was unimaginable. How did they show that? Because social media had been the platform in which we had started off and we had grown and were mainly communicating, it, it was a platform that people also used to express that. And I guess this is where maybe we, I began to also learn about the other side, the dark side of social media, in that whilst we can start amazing things with social media, it's also possible that we can destroy each other with it. Yeah. And people hid behind the fact that it's just a, page or it's just a profile and said things that they would never probably say in person. I was called a sellout. Um, I was called a coward. Um, people wrote op-eds about my, uh, uh, my running away and how useless I was and how I used people for my own ends and benefits. And what did that do to you? It probably stands out as one of the most difficult times during this journey. Not because I felt people had attacked me because I think that had I been in their shoes, I probably would have done exactly the same. But I think that it was difficult to understand because I began to see how much when people are oppressed that they don't count themselves as part of the solution or they don't see themselves as being someone that can actually free themselves. They would rather find a hero somewhere. They would rather let a foreign nation or something come and 
drag them out of the situation. So did you continue your fight when you had left Zimbabwe or did you stop it during that time? Oh, I absolutely continued my fight when I'd left Zimbabwe. Um, the day I left, I remember um, the, the day I left, the day after that Robert Mugabe was um, at a um, national event where he was addressing people. And he mentioned me in that speech as he had done a few times before. And he said, people like Ivan Mawarire have got no place in the future of Zimbabwe. And that did something to me. I am a Zimbabwean. Mm. I'm born in Zimbabwe. I have a right to be in Zimbabwe. And there is no person who can ban me from the country of my birth. And so that became something that made me lose sleep. And I made the decision that I would come back to Zimbabwe. All I wanted to see was the birth of my daughter. And as soon as she was born, I would make my way back. And a month after she was born, I asked my wife for permission to go back. And I have to pay homage to her because she's an amazing woman and she allowed me to go back home to Zimbabwe. I arrived back in Zimbabwe on the 1st of February, 2017. And before my passport could get stamped at the airport, I was surrounded by nine security agents and arrested immediately and taken away. I spent weeks in a maximum security prison where all sorts of things happened. But even though I was afraid when we did go there, the one thing that that place did was to strengthen my resolve to never stop speaking truth to power and never stop finding freedom and liberty because that, those are the only things that you have left as a person when you've lost everything. Um. At what point did you think what you were doing could have a real impact on ousting Robert Mugabe? Well, I guess one of those moments came in prison. I was arrested maybe another, another four times after that first arrest. Um, and one of those times actually was I was arrested whilst I was in church, uh, whilst I was delivering a, a sermon, I was preaching. And one of my elders came and whispered in my ear and said, you might not want to end the message now because the police are outside waiting to pick <laughs> you up. So they took me away and we went to prison again. And I met a group of men there that changed the way I saw what we were doing. There's four men. The one man is serving a life sentence for murder. And another man was serving about nine years for, um, I think it was armed robbery, and another two men for something else. And these four men met me when I went into this prison, and they said, we, first of all, we want you to know that you are going to be safe in this prison. And the reason you're going to be safe is that we have heard about what you are doing. And we don't know how else to contribute to what you're doing because we're in here. But our contribution is going to be that whatever you need, whilst you are here, we will make sure you get it so that you can go back and continue to fight for our families. And it, it completely changed my life because if people that are in prison serving a life sentence can have hope that something can change, then why should I give up yeah. when I'm outside and I have freedom? And at that point I knew that if we carried on pushing, if we carried on standing, if we were able to onboard more and more people onto what we were doing in terms of just speaking up, just telling the authorities what we were not happy about, that we would end up with the movement of people that the government considered weak, but in actual fact, had become much stronger than they suspected. You said at one point, no one can fight for Zimbabwe like a Zimbabwean can. Does that mean the fight has to come from the heart? People have got to have skin in the game to, to want change? Absolutely. I've always spoken in the last two years when I've, I've been asked to speak on, on many platforms that I'm so honoured to speak. And I often look at my, my resume and the platforms I'm asked to speak. And I think if people ever saw my resume, they would probably <laughs> walk out and be surprised. But the one thing that is important, especially for young people to understand, is that we cannot subcontract our struggle. 
if you want something and you want it badly, you have to be present for it. And the reason I came back, and this is one of the strange happenings, is that when I left Zimbabwe, people said he's a coward, he has no vision, he's a sellout. And when I came back to Zimbabwe and I was arrested at the airport, the same people said he's an idiot, he's stupid for having come back. <laughs> but the, the understanding suddenly became that we are the people we have been waiting for. Yeah. And that nobody, absolutely nobody, has an understanding of the future that you want. Therefore, you are the one that has the kind of strength, passion, and tenacity that it takes to deliver that future for yourself. How long all up have you spent in jail? I think in total I've probably spent on and off maybe up to about two months um, on different arrests and different occasions. Um, and I guess it's, 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 it's those journeys in and out of prison that have made me understand that if this is what it's going to take, if this is going to be the life that I have to live until we attain the kind of liberty and freedom that we need, then it must be lived. That journey must actually be walked. And it's become quite commonplace that every time I leave the country or travel back, I'm pulled aside by security agents for questioning. They rummage through my passport or my luggage, and then usually they'll let me go. So can I ask you, going back next week or whenever you're going, you're just out for a few days, is that in your head that that's going to happen? Oh, absolutely. It's, it, it will almost always happen. Um, but again, like I said, I don't have any bitterness towards the security agents themselves. In fact, in many cases, I begin to talk with them about their own lives and I ask them how their children are, how they're managing with the economy, especially right now in Zimbabwe, mm. the economy is not good. And so it, for me, I see them as, as, as Zimbabweans who also need, are looking for solutions, who are looking for help. Has there been a point during those, one of those long nights in jail or in talking to your wife that you've thought, I've done what I can, I don't want to do this anymore? There have been many moments like that. I, I, would, not, I would not sit here and pretend as if um, I've always been completely committed. Many times I've wanted to bail out and just to leave it and just go back to a quiet and ordinary life. And I've discovered it's not possible actually to go back to a quiet and ordinary life uh, anymore. Um, and, and again, the sense has always been that I don't want to reinforce the, the idea that if we can't deal with something, we abandon it. Yes. We have a generation of people coming up that have to have a new way of being committed to seeing Zimbabwe become what it's supposed to become. This would remain difficult for your family though? Oh, absolutely, it, it would. Uh, it means that I have to live apart from my family continuously. Um, at, uh, I, th I think the longest that I'd lived apart from my family was about 14 months, uh, which I had been in prison and when I came out, the government had taken my passport and refused for me to travel uh, outside the country. And so it's, it comes at that great cost. Let me tell you one of probably my greatest fears with all of this. It is that one day my children would grow up and would not understand what I was doing or why I was doing it. And I would have to be okay with that because I did abandon them, because I have left them to go back to try and help a nation. It is our nation. But my hope would be that they would one day look back and understand what their dad was trying to do and be able to emulate that and be able to live as free people no matter where they are because they understand that no matter what they gain in life, if they lose their liberty and the freedom, they've lost everything. Yeah. So... You're speaking as a dad there too, aren't you? But, you know, so Mugabe's gone. He's not the problem. It's, it's the system, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Explain yeah. that to us. Well, we, the process of having Mugabe resign was an exciting process for many Zimbabweans. There were many dynamics at play. 
Uh, for those that followed the process, you would know that the military made the first move. But the citizens, we had been on this journey for quite a while now. And um, when we marched, we made the decision that we would mobilize citizens to march on the street against Robert Mugabe for him to resign. And people have looked back and they've said, you shouldn't have done that. You made a mistake. You supported the military who were part of the system. And we've said we understood that. But we had a choice to make. In the moment that the military was pushing Robert Mugabe to leave, would we sit and let them do it themselves? Or would we also come and claim a stake? Because if we are part of this moment, it means we can claim a part in the future. We can turn around and say to them, you, you did not remove him yourself. We did it together. And that allows us to be able to build going forward. But more than that, it was a moment in which we were able to activate the weakest of our citizens or the most afraid of our citizens to do something they'd never done before. And, and, and when we did that in our hundreds of thousands and millions, we also began to believe in people power, which is alive today against the very system that Mugabe left that is still being used to oppress the people of Zimbabwe. So tell me about that people power. Is it at all time high levels of support or is it waned off after he left or, or, or what is it looking like now? Well, we've gone through, we've gone through different waves. Um, and where we are now, I have to say, undoubtedly, there are more people today in Zimbabwe that have the courage to speak truth to power than we have ever had before. And it's a result of the last two and a half years, or in fact, even more than the last two and a half years where I began. We had people like the late Morgan Changirai, who began in the, in the late 90s by forming some of the first um, opposition movements in Zimbabwe. And, um, but then it was, it was always politicians that then spoke truth to power, never ordinary people. And so we're at a point right now where the galvanizing of citizens is beginning to take place again, maybe this time around more sustainable um, uh, ways in which to make representations to government. Whereas before, with what we had started, they were more spontaneous. It was more, uh, you know, people with ideas and suddenly just getting it done uh, and seeing results and being excited about it. But now we're talking more and more about how do we teach people to hold government to account? So I think more than half your country's population is actually under the age of 25. Yep. How, how do you ensure those young, maybe first-time voters, actually help change history? Well, I think that we, we cannot um, run away from the fact that our, our young people have a different idea of what the future looks like from uh, what I guess the, uh, uh, the, 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 the legacy leaders uh, you know, have had. And there has to be a way to begin to draw young people into leadership. Zimbabwe is in desperate need of regenerating its leadership across the board. And um, uh, we begin to miss out on creating the kind of future that these young people want when we exclude them from places uh, of leadership. But also, I think, allowing young people to continue to initiate things that even we in our generations don't agree with or don't, don't see as being things that could change. Uh, because I think that's what would begin to push Zimbabwe into, into the direction where, you know, where she needs to go. Our young people in Zimbabwe are vibrant, they're excited, and here's a key thing about them, they actually are fearless. Uh, we, we said this to Robert Mugabe when he began to question what we were doing. And we said the same spirit that gripped you in the 1960s when you went to war against colonialism is the same one that grips us today as we fight for our freedom. It's sad, however, that we have to fight our own fathers for our freedom. How you got your original message out on YouTube, on, on a video on a phone. How but you've since seen the dark side of, of social media too. How important is digital technologies in providing a means of, of communication in a country like Zimbabwe? It's, it's extremely important. The, the social media and the digital age has allowed us to gather in places and ways that doing it physically would, would have been impossible or would have been extremely dangerous. And so we, find, we found that we were able to gather around an idea, discuss an idea, grow the idea, and 
I even implement uh, different actions, you know, for people on social media. Um, WhatsApp is a is a is a is a is a piece of communication technology that has gone really crazy in Zimbabwe in terms of allowing people to share different ideas or to uh, you know bring people together around an idea. So I think that has meant uh, a lot more freedom. We've been able to circumnavigate the usual. Um, uh, the usual actions of, of uh, you know, the authorities in terms of clamping down. When we did the shutdown of the country, actually, in 2016, it was, it was literally all done on social media. And the government thought the best way to deal with that would be to shut the internet down. And so for about 60 to maybe eight hours, they completely shut the internet down in Zimbabwe. But it had the opposite effect. Instead, what it did is that there was a lot more interest from people in terms of why are they shutting it down, what's going on? And through that, I remember the night before the shutdown happened and we got news that the internet would be shut down, we spent the whole night teaching people through videos on uh, Facebook and WhatsApp, teaching people how to use VPNs and how to set those up. So we had a, an overnight kind of a university session for maybe about four million people to quickly learn how to do this. So whilst the shutdown happened, there was information that was going on. And when the internet came back up, it, it just exploded once again uh, to, to, even, to an even greater uh, level. So with each of those wins, is there less fear and more optimism that things will change? I think there is definitely less fear. Um, and when people see the results of one man with one video or five young people in a protest, we had so many young people that would go and do these five man or ten man protests and they'd get arrested and brutalized and it would all be caught on video. And with some of one of a group of our friends, we knew that they would be arrested and beaten for it. So some of them were strategically located in, in, in hidden areas with cameras to, to video the arrests. And the idea was to try and show people that it, you, you, you probably will be brutalized. It's going to happen, but it must be done. So I think that brought a lot more boldness. Our, our catch statement that we ran with for the whole campaign uh, of this flag was, if we cannot cause the politician to change, then we must inspire the citizen to be bold. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what we ran with, you know, that boldness. So we're at a point now where in Zimbabwe, yes, there is optimism. Um, and the challenge is to grow the optimism because it's so easy to kind of run with the negativity and the bitterness and the hopelessness uh, of, of how things are going. So if you were back in your kitchen back in 2016, you've got your phone. If you went back, would you do it differently? <laughs> is there anything that you would change? I think... On that original video of April 19, 2016, I, I wouldn't change a thing. It, it, it captured how I felt and how at that very moment, without any filters, how I really felt about where Zimbabwe was, but more importantly, about what we needed to do as Zimbabweans. And you'll see at the end of that video, I, I challenge Zimbabweans to say, if you expect this flag to fly with pride, and you're not a part of it, then you're not ready to bring change to Zimbabwe. So I wouldn't change that. But I, I also have to admit that in the journey of, of the last two and a half to three years, there are some mistakes that we have made. There are some mistakes I have made. Um, I, I did not train for this journey at all. Um, but a lot of those mistakes have been learning curves uh, for me on how to do things better. What can we in this room do? What message do you want to want to leave us with? Our world is in, is, in, is in need of more and more people that are prepared to stand for what they believe. And it's easy f sometimes to stand with a crowd of people, to hide behind a crowd of people. And I guess the request for Zimbabwe would be that you would continue to amplify what you hear Zimbabweans trying to do to free themselves or to better their own lives. There's many, many, many amazing Zimbabweans. I'm just one story amongst hundreds of thousands. I wonder if your congregation, that, that 50 
group of 50 people who would come along in 2016 and hear your sermons. How big are your congregations nowadays? <laughs> well, you know, because again, I haven't really slowed down on this journey of challenging the government and holding them to account. I think a lot of people would rather listen to my sermons from afar. <laughs> and so, and I, and I understand that. So we continue to have a, a really small congregation, which I enjoy because the people that have remained with us um, watched me get arrested on, uh, on one of the Sunday services. And what was amazing about it is that as the police led me away to the police car, the congregation came out of the church and walked behind me and they sang worship songs all the way to the car up until they took me away. And so I think they have a very special place in my heart and mm. I in theirs as well. And I, together, I believe we continue to, to, to serve our nation the best way possible. You said that the teacher of your children, you owed a great deal to her. I think I'm probably talking about ev to, for everyone in this room where uh, the people of Zimbabwe owe a, a hell of a lot to you. Evan, thank you very much. Thank you very Please much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.